Good day, world. Welcome to Be In The Moment. Today, I am delighted to be with two exceptional people, Krez and Callistus. Good day, world. Yes. So Krez is in the Philippines and Callistus is in Nigeria. I am here in the state of Georgia in the USA. And thank you so much to Krez for your introduction of Callistus and I together. Yes, thank you so much for having us. Um, yeah, uh, I'm so glad to be in this be in the moment. Like I'm just watching this on YouTube and I feel like when I saw this on my calendar, oh my God, I want to be in the moment. So thank you so much, Rory, <laughs> for uh, inviting us. <laughs> my pleasure. Thank you, yes. Rory. Thank you. And I understand that Krez and Callistus, you both are associates together at the BSB Bitcoin Association. So have you, how have you collaborated so far together? Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, okay, Chris. Okay, so right now what we have in the moment, like I have no personal um, project with uh, Callistus, but our um, entities that, you know, our, our companies are doing some programs in Nigeria. So the Bitcoin SV Academy, uh, Big, under Bitcoin Association, of course, and the the program with Dominium, um, uh, educating massive number of students to have the blockchain technology education. I'm so excited if Callistus would, you know, take over and explain this more. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Chris, and thanks, Roy. Yes, so um, both of us, we belong to the BSV Association and the BSV. And um, right now, um, there's a unique uh, pro uh, proposition we have in Nigeria, where the government, the Nigerian government, the Ministry for Communication and Digital Economy, through one of its arm called the National Information Technology De um, Development Authority, NITDA. So NITDA, they came up with a policy. They want to train 1 million Nigerians in digital skills, okay? And it cut across different sectors of, um, of, the, of um, digital skills. And now, but they pay special attention to blockchain. So right now, um, they officially, you know, engage Dominion to train 30,000 Nigerians to become blockchain developers, right? So now in BSV, uh, Dominion, we're already in the BSV space and we have access to the BSV and they have all the, um, the infrastructure, the materials, you know, to be able to train students on the use of blockchain. We're looking at the Bitcoin in particular because with Bitcoin, you can develop so many applications. So why I say this, I want to highlight the importance of government coming into this. Um, from what I know, um, Nigerian government, they want to incorporate blockchain into most of the activities they do. You know, there have been some shortcomings, or so we've been a third world country, but they say, hey, we can bridge this gap, all right? We can merge it, you know, remove inefficiency, remove corruption. So they say, we can start by training our people to become developers. So that's where we are. And the costs have been super great. Right now, we have over 31,000 active students training to become blockchain developers. And the hell or is going on. I think uh, maybe uh, during the course of the program, I'll be saying more about that. So yes, and we um, that being in the same space, you know, handling stuff um, with the BSV2. And we've talked about um, more collaboration whereby we've been bringing our students to some live programs like this, you know, where Chris will be able to, um, you know, um, champion that and reach out more to the community. So yes, it's an exciting period in Nigeria and I'm super happy to be part of this. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. That is very inspiring. And you say that they have the government there in Nigeria. They want to, as a first step, educate the people, educate the youth so they can become builders. And do they say what they foresee people building? What are some of the ideas of what the developers will then do with their skills? 
Okay, thank you for that. In fact, right now, if you if you go to YouTube, um, let's say LinkedIn, and type NITDA, NITDA Blockchain Project, mm -hmm. it's trending, there's hashtag. So we got our students, they come up with all kinds of wonderful ideas. Let me start from the obvious. Um, Nigeria, we're in the election period right now. Election just happened. The first set, we got a presidential election done. Now, on Saturday, there will be state uh, um, election for governors and um, you know people in the um, in the state house of assemblies is coming up, and there has been issue around how the election was, um, you know, how it was held about data integrity, mm -hmm. right? About um, um, you know about the transparency of the process. So right now we have tons of ideas from students. They want to build a blockchain-based um, voting system that will eliminate any kind of fraud or maybe trying to um, you know tamper with data, right? That's very, um, it's popular among the students right now. We have a couple of them doing that because we give them a blank check. We say, hey, go ahead. Whatever thing you think you can build that is native to Nigeria, that can solve a native problem, can you come up with such ideas? So the idea of you know creating a, um, a, a, a blockchain-based voting system that's more transparent and um, you know can be audited by anyone. So that's one. Also, we have problem of micropayments in Nigeria. Um, the infrastructure, yeah, the banks are there. So the CB and CB and the Central Bank of Nigeria, they they pushing a policy to transform Nigeria from cash-based economy to cashless. Right now in Nigeria, people move along with cash a lot. Somebody can uh, can buy something worth of, let's say, one thousand USD, for example, with cash in Nigeria, right? So uh, most businesses, they move around with cash. So the CBN say, hey, we want to stop that, want to go cashless. And they did that. They started with the re redesign of the Nigerian Naira, okay, which kind of limit the number of um, amount of money in circulation, forcing people to, to go cashless. So the effect was that the banking system, they've been optimized to do certain types of transactions, certain volume. Now the volume spiked up. So some of the infrastructure, they couldn't support it. So you see someone trying to make a, you, you, make, you buy something, you want to make a payment with your card, or you want to make a bank transfer, and it's taking forever to get uh, confirmation that has been done. So it's critical. It, right now, it's a big problem in Nigeria. So our students already, they are coming up with all kinds of solutions for micropayments. And they're looking at blockchain. Because remember, Nigeria as a country has implemented the e naira is a CBDC, Central Bank Digital Currency. Nigeria has played, is one of the countries in the world, one of the first countries to implement mm -hmm. the CBDC. So we have what we call the e naira is blockchain based. So right now, some of us that we are looking at, um, how can we make micro payments where, you, you know, in the blockchain, once you make a transaction, it's done. There's no reversal. But in the not regular banking, so you can make a transaction now, the person goes away and the money gets reversed. And it's difficult to trace who that person is, right? So, but with a blockchain based payment system that can support micro transaction, you could have solutions where in the villages, in remote areas, where people don't have access to good um, uh, communication infrastructure, they can actually make transactions, even for very small amount. And that's why we are leveraging the BSV blockchain because BSV's blockchain supports microtransaction. You know, the fees, you get something 0 0.001 something USD, you know, cents or yeah, 0 0.001 dollars, for example. When you convert that to Naira, it's still very little amount in terms of shares. So yes, you can afford to buy tomatoes, to buy your agri products from the farmer directly and make payments. So these are some of it. And I was looking through some of them. People are saying, oh, in government also, you know, with the one in interest transparency, you know, where different, you have the, you have the Nigerian police, you have the civil defense, they're all into, um, you know, um, prevention of crime and all stuff like that. Uh, what kind of synergy would they, okay, they take people to court. Is there a synergy that goes from what you have from the um, NSDC to the police and back to the court? where you don't get points oh we can't find this file oh we can't find that data and they're looking for solution on the blockchain it's huge so you could just check on linkedin niche that blockchain project you'll see all kinds of ideas they are sharing their ideas they're excited about that and the good thing is this program we are doing is not just to train them no we want them to build solutions so the project is a huge part of it 
right? So we will graduate the first set by April, ending of April. Once we do that graduation, people that did very well will move into the project phase. Being supported by BSV, because BSV, they have in the ecosystem, you have technical partners. So they are coming in to help these Nigerians build solution for Nigeria that solves our native problems, because we want to start with that. Great solution for us, okay? And then maybe look out to after um, other African countries. And that's it. Thank you. <laughs> wow. Fabulous. So you touched on many critical infrastructures yet again. So talking about the integrity of the voting system through the use of a transparent ledger, the blockchain. Uh, you also mentioned the CBDC that you've already rolled out there in Nigeria. So what is the word, uh, you know, close to the ground there among your neighbors? Are there lots of different opinions? How do people feel about already using the CBDC and making a transition from the paper and coins into digital mm. currency completely? Yes. Um, right now, the CBDC, yeah, it was launched. And I think as, at launch, there was some, you know, um, some hiccups here and there, because like me, of course, I was one of the people that tried to get into the system, download it there. So there was hiccups here and there. So it didn't just trend immediately. But the good thing is the central bank has gone back. They have reiterated, you know, look at what they have. In fact, they've been sponsored a, 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 um, a hackathon. In the hackathon, they were saying, hey, can you come up with ways we can functionalize the in era? So they developed it, but it wasn't cast. They are looking at how can we improve on it, right? So in during the hackathon, people come up with a, a kind of ideas to functionalize it. And in our program, we have special interest for students that want to work on that. Okay, so we are hoping that by the time we have 30, some 30,000 students building all kind of projects, and some of them will involve micropayment that are looking at functionalizing the e naira once we go more around so natively in nigeria they are just used to doing transfers from one bank to the other so the normal centralized banking system the e naira is there but it's not that common it's not it's not an everyday thing you know yeah. you hardly see people using it so our plan is to come up with some solution that will make it bring it mainstream so it's still a work in the progress like you know, there are so many countries that they are still thinking about the idea of CBDC. They have not even implemented it yet. So Nigeria took the first step. It's not so perfect, but they're iterating it. And we hope that as we go along, you know, building all this infrastructure, creating the awareness, because these 31,000 students, they were drawn from all across Nigeria, different backgrounds, different religions, different ethnicity. And we, we made it such that you don't need to be tech savvy to come into the program, because it's not all about coding. Some people, they have good ideas. For example, they already have um, experience. The experience was something. So we're encouraging a situation whereby even though you can be a lawyer, right? You can be a medical doctor. You don't know how to code. Well, that's fine. Come into the program. You interact with people that code. You bring your own idea, how this can implement in, in the medical field. The lawyer comes in, you know. So we, we're making it so that we're not so strict about you must be able to do Java and Golang. No. We recognize their diversity. And because it's a government project, we're encouraging more people to come in. So what that we do is we accelerate blockchain adoption in Nigeria. And that has been the goal of NIDA for starting this program. So yes, so the whole CBDC thing will pick up as um, more programs like this come on uh, mainstream. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, so That's as more so folks get involved, you can collaborate. I love yeah. that because it takes all types. You need the code, you need the musician, you need the artist, you need many different skills together to make something very meaningful. So yes, yeah. what were you thinking, Chris? Yes, I, I'm thinking that this is a great um, stuff and uh, I, I'm really looking forward uh, to, to the success of, of all the um, students, speeches, and projects that they have on the table. So I know already the figure that we are talking about here, Kalisos. If you are generous enough to, to 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 tell the audience how many people we are talking about here, they will it will it will surely blow their mind. Like how many thousands of people we're talking about in the program? Uh, can you can you say that again, please, Chris? Uh, can you repeat that, please? Thank you. Yes. Um, my question is, 
Um, we, we see this a huge project, um, touches the government and the builders across the country, right? So if you can tell to our audience how huge is the figure we're talking about here, how huge is the impact, how many students we have in the, in the program. Okay, so wh when we announced this scheme, government told us they want to train 30,000. They will take care of 30,000. So when we announced this scheme, we got application of about 120 something thousand people applied, applied for the program. The huge, the number was huge. And we can understand why, because it's novelty in, oh, blockchain, government. So there was lots of interest, about 100 and something thousand people applied, right? So, but then, you know, they have to go through some scaling thing. Where, of course, you have to first apply, apply properly, you know, put your data correctly and all stuff like that. So, and there were some duplicates application too. But when we trimmed down everything, you know, we, we got close to about 31,000. Right now we're on 32,000 because some more people enter into the program. So we have 32,000 active people. Uh, we are using a resource on BSV, the fifth work is part of the BSV ecosystem. So we're using the portal there to, you know, the whole cost contents are consumed there. And then we also have live sessions where we bring people from the um, BSV um, ecosystem to take starting courses, you know, explain more to the students. So yes, the number is huge. And let me say this, uh, we understood from government, this is just a first step. They want to train more. So they said, let's see how this go first. Start with small. And after small, we're going big. So we'll wait to see when we graduate this set. But I tell you one thing, the number would be way more than what we have right now. Thank you. Yes, that's so amazing, right, Rory? It's 31,000 currently running for, for the courses. And it's a huge number, right? Um, with this 31,000, I know you have different kind of business ideas or you know projects that you have in mind so if you can pick maybe top five of ideas that you have from your students okay for me the top five ideas um yeah the voting the uh, blockchain based voting system is good then micro payments okay micro payment there are different variation of them you know right now we are still at the testing their ideas. That's why we want them to talk about them. Let's see how popular they are with people. We don't want to be the one to say, hey, it's ABC. We want to see all these ideas. Which one do Nigerians resonate more with? And whatever they resonate more with, we go with it. So we haven't done that yet because the project is still there. They are still talking about their ideas. In fact, they are forming different groups in different states of, of Nigeria, right? They are meeting on Saturdays to discuss all these ideas. But for me, I think and the voting thing is OK. We also have the micro payments, okay, because we want to solve this payment solution. Another one is traceability. So in traceability, it happens in different sectors. We have the agricultural product traceability, where uh, when you get a seed from getting the species of, a, of whatever plant it is, you know, data goes to the blockchain. And uh, when you plant it, what are the planting conditions? We have IOTs that will get all those data, the plantings, uh, you know, the, the, the humidity, the pH, you know, there are all kinds of parameters you measure in farming. Okay, IoT will upload everything to the blockchain, and then we move on to the point where, as they are going, um, what, what kind of chemical fertilizers we are used, um, herbicide, all those data goes into the blockchain. Then you move into um, harvesting, and then um, even the storage, under what condition we are these things stored. So at the end of the day, you have a plant, uh, agricultural produce that you can actually attest that, okay, this are the condition and whether they met, meet to standard. In Nigeria, they have one major problem. They plant some, let's take cowpea, for example. Cowpea is a crop that grows very well in Nigeria. But when they try to export it, at the point of export, say, oh, we are not sure about, we don't know what went into planting this thing. We don't know whether the best prices we have, you know, we have followed. So it made them lose money. Right. So with this solution, if I they need that a government, they are interested in this solution. With solution like this, we'll have a, a framework where farmers can sign in and we deploy those technology in their farms. So we should be able to know, you know, if, if you want to consume, you know, OK, these are the conditions where under where it went through, you can actually trace them. And you can't, mm -hmm. since the blockchain base, you can't falsify them. So even to the um, 
to someone that want to the people they want to export to they know okay yeah it meets all these marks and that and that so it will help to get make farmers earn more and also lead to you know um um you know health security you know because you know what you are consuming so we are looking at that and also in pharmaceutical interestability in pharmaceutical we have issue of um um so fake drugs you know sometimes you, they come in through different borders you cannot control them right mm -hmm. so um so some students are looking at making a solution that can trace all this um stuff you know uh, as you get it and use them up they you know they go back uh, we could know that in the blockchain okay this abc went through all this it was genuine and has been consumed and all stuff like that the batch number so traceability is one other big thing we are looking at yeah so other than that people also have ideas about um, social media right nigeria had the numbers you know nigeria is we have good big population of youth in fact more than 60 percent of nigerians are youth right so some want to develop um, blockchain, uh, a blockchain a web trade blockchain based social media where um, people actually have access to their data you, you don't sell before you can use someone's data you have to consent and for those data they have let's say in let's say if they start getting advertisement um revenue from using those data they give back certain percentage to the owners of those data so you have your data you can monetize your data right and you can decide i don't want to share my data right and your data will not be shared with anyone so and this is another thing we want to look at if we can come up with a solution like that with super fine we could use it for as a as, as a, a playground for so many other things because we have more cohorts coming we can use to train other cohorts so i tell you what the opportunities they are great the ideas are great yeah so we just uh, what is just between us now <laughs> the bsv training our people right government is really not ready because they've they've given us the environment and let me say this the nigerian government they are very careful about this, making sure everything is in place. That's what we call the Startup Act. It was just launched. What, let me explain what it means. Now, if you want to do a FinTech, for example, in Nigeria, there are so many barriers. You need to have a minimal capital. Those capital is not here. You must have been in big business, you know, or have um, investors to raise that kind of money. Now, you, here you are, you develop a solution, this novel, but you cannot take it to the market because of the barrier. So the Startup Act in Nigeria, which was just inaugurated recently, was it two days ago? It was live. Mohamed Jega, the co-founder of Dominion, was part of that team. He was in that two days ago. It was live, yes. So oh, what is Startup? Yes, yes. So what it does is that it gives special, um, you know, way, a leeway for startup like this. It helps them go to the market without going all through those barriers. You see, so... I must give credit to the Ministry of Communication and Digital Economy in Nigeria, especially the NIDA, um, led by um, Professor Inua Abdullahi. You know, he's a great visionary, putting all the steps. So it's not just doing one thing and it's a silo. No, they are trying to all interconnect. And it's a great time in Nigeria. I'm looking forward that in the next couple of years or something, we'll be exporting great talents out of here and solutions. And, and yeah <laughs> yes thank you that's super exciting so this act just passed to support the ingenuity of the people with the startup support go to market that's support right for startups and this yeah. is so exciting we live in such a wonderful time we have access to each other to communicate to interact and then to build solutions that pertain to our own neighborhood, our own town, our own country, and then learn from each other and grow, you know, make things better always. And it gives access to all of the people to be a part of this, to really build what they need. You know, we can all build what we need everywhere. So that is super exciting. And, uh, you know, hats off to you, Callistus, for your leadership and your mentorship and also your administration of, of running all of these programs that you do there. Uh, now, I'd love to hear more about you and how did you get into this uh, industry of technology and science? What led you into this field of, of discovery and building? Uh, thank you. 
I, I would say that I've always been intrigued with new things, new technology, new way of doing things. Okay, I've always been fascinated by them. So way back in 2005 or so, yeah, so I had this um, um, course at University of Portacot in Nigeria, you know, computer maintenance, and I went to computer programming. But at the time, programming was not a thing, right? It was more of computer. So we cloned computers, organizations they want to have computers, we install them, we set them up. We run computer networks, you know, I've done way back then, we've done network of about 200 points, you know, local internet network. And then what well, we have dialogue communication then, dialogue internet, very slow, but we thought that was it. And then along the line, we moved on, VSAT came, yeah, I was involved in set, installing VSAT for companies, you know, uh, it's more of a, that was the broadband as of those days, you know, we have wow. the C band, that we have the KU band. So I've done all those stuff, right? And then we moved on to managing computer servers, Windows server in those days. Not, I wasn't Linux at the time. So we set up servers to, you know, Active Directory to run organization. And we go offshore to, you know, support IT infrastructure in floating production of floating platform, FPSOs. You know, Nigeria yeah. is an oil, you know, you know, it's, it's an oil producing country. So there are lots of FPSOs around. So I work in that field, just supporting those infrastructure, the, the, the servers and the ERP. In fact, I work with American Bureau of Shipping, um, ABS. They have this software they call the NS5. Those days use them to manage um, platforms. So I was more like, a, yeah, a tech guy, you know, so we do all those mm -hmm. stuff. So it was more of hardware to work at the time, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, and then I was I was like, okay, I've got so much kids doing computer. What's the next big thing? Then there was biotech going on. If you look at my profile, I have a degree in biotechnology. Right. So it's still about the, um, you know, new things. I like doing new things. So I went to the biotech, um, which took me to University of Nottingham in, in, in the UK, where I did an MSc in bioengineering. Then I came back to Nigeria and co-founded a company called the African Biosciences. So we were the premier company here in Nigeria, trying to bridge, you know, bring biotech into, into the community there. And the market was, the, it's a niche market, it's very narrow. So it was more of academics. Um, mm -hmm. So we have a research lab, you know, we support them with equipment, with technical skills, their DNA sequencing and all stuff like that and run there. But then um, mm -hmm. at that time, Nigeria, there were so many strikes going on in Nigeria. So the market was so narrow and with the strikes, at some time, the university we are home for close to a year, so it affected the revenue and all mm -hmm. stuff like that. It's still running. We have, um, um, you know, scientists working on those labs. But I decided at that point to go back to IT. So <laughs> coming back into IT, it's more of software now. You know, I started with the whole hardware thing, building mm -hmm. servers and all stuff like that. But we moved on from that. So now it's all about building solutions, right? So yeah, so I I, I did Python and. More important, I was involved in is a ERP called Odoo. So what it does is Odoo is an open source. So you can use it to manage entire organization from, from human resources to accounting to projects to, and these are things I'm already been exposed to. So we build more, I build modules for all kinds of modules for that, you know. So I'm based in Portaco then support, supported many um, oil servicing companies, right? And so that was the state of thing. And because I've been a hardware person from the day, I do servers, I do a lot of stuff. And we also do hosting, you know, because we host different companies, all those ERPs, they are open source. So we have our own infrastructure to host them. So that means I need to manage plenty cloud servers. I need a way to automate these things. That was what led to me being in DevOps, again, all the DevOps kids, setting up the pipelines, because when a client goes down, you want them to be, to be up like the next minute right mm -hmm. so the docker containers if you want to manage docker container you need the tools that's where kubernetes comes in so yeah all the stuff going on and then blockchain came up right well i have all these skills already i very good with programming you know understand the 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 it space very well right so i think i was involved in the it was yeah, it was, I think it was a Binance. Yeah, they did a master class on blockchain for Africa. So I was part of that team. I think that's where the whole thing kicked off. And um, yeah, we moved on. After getting all those skills, I joined uh, Dominion Blockchain Solution. Because Dominion, they've been doing a lot of stuff in the blockchain already, not just for Nigeria. There are different countries, Dominions are working it, right? So as a country CTO now, 
in Dominion. I basically manage all the um, technology-related stuff. And beyond that, um, at Bayes University, Bayes University is a private university in Nigeria, but one of the elite schools in Nigeria. So we went into partnership with them, established a blockchain center, which I am the director for that center. So what is going on? We are bringing academia and the industry together. So some of the projects we are doing, we have the academy, if something, for example, um, for the traceability program, the design of those IOTs will happens in the university, in their electronic depart electronics department, right? So that brought a synergy between the, the academia and the, you know, and the industry. And now we have the government. So it's a complete mix, right? Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so that has it been for me. And right now, my whole passion is about building solutions on the blockchain right now, right? And of course, using DevOps to maintain all those you know, because everything we do, we deploy them on, on clouds. So that has kind of been my journey. It's just all about the interest. Um, it's, uh, you know, fascinated by technology and uh it, it pushes me to push go more into it thank you yeah that's so amazing i just have a question with you Calistos, because from the transition from hardware to software is not easy right and also um the, the languages that we have at the moment keeps on updating from time to time so if you do if you will not catch up with the latest one you'll be left behind so what what, what is the challenge for you when you try to enter the blockchain technology from from python or from the uh from the previous languages that you use okay the the challenge is you have to keep learning i don't i never stop learning okay maybe i missed a bit part um i must give credit to andela andela is a company in nigeria they partnered with google and they formed the google africa developer scholarship i was part of if i from inception i was part of it from inception so it gave me opportunity now, you know, it was where well created program I went through, I, I went straight into cloud because I felt I fit in more into cloud. So I went through that program in, uh, with Google Africa Developer Scholarship and that's where I got, get most of my experience, you know, um, let me say um, academic experience trying to go into the cloud, right? And plus I have a sandbox already because I'm in the, I'm in the, I already, I'm in the market already. So there are people that need the solution. So as I learn the stuff, we apply them. Uh, for example, I've set up a data center for a government agency in Nigeria. You know how the law requires certain data to reside in the country, not outside the country. So I've been involved in setting up a data center, in-house data center for a, a government organization here. Uh, these are the skills. So wh when you are learning the skill and you are applying it, it makes a whole lot of difference, right? And I never stopped learning. Uh, recently, I started learning C language, C. So yeah, because Python was much more I drove with. Right now, I'm an expert in C. I never stopped learning, right? As we talk now, I still have some courses I'm, I'm still engaged with. And blockchain is a new thing, new stuff. It's not yet, we don't even know where it's going to yet, right? So most of the materials are being developed right now. So you don't ever stop learning. So it's a continuous process. So apart from doing my work, most nights I'm awake, uh, maybe four hours, five hours some days, depending, you know, trying to get more insight in this case, learn more of those skills, right? So yeah, that has been the challenge. You don't ever stop learning. You keep learning. As new stuff are coming up, uh, you keep learning as, as they are doing exploit. And we have seen flaws. Okay, you learn new, how do you fix that? So it never stops. <laughs> it's a continuous stop. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. so true. Because if you stop, like you, you become complacent to the technology that you have, you'll be left behind for the next six months. Right. Keep on learning. Right. That's and great. have you studied the S script that we've seen? It was uh, the smart contracting language that was developed by Xiaohui Liu. Uh, no, have one, you see? Lots of things to know. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. Well, maybe that is uh, in an, a different arena. I guess smart contracting, mm -hmm. that could be used more for uh, relationships. Is that true? Or could it also be used for infrastructure development? I'm not sure. Basically. Um, oh, okay. I you mean smart contract in general? Yes. Yes. Oh, contract. you are talking of a particular one. The Bitcoin yes, smart the, contract. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, smart contract. I mean, everything our students will be doing. Ex- okay, I missed this part. There's this part where they want to, some people want to form something like a cooperative where people do contribution. It's been happening in the, in the physical world. So in the physical world in Nigeria, it's very common for people to come together. Every day they put, they set aside a certain amount of money. They save with a, co- a cooperative, okay? And then the money gets huge. Let's say there are 100 in the group. It comes so be they give it at the end of they give it to one person the person can use such big money to do a project but the problem with that is as they're contributing this money at some point the person in charge of the money might might embezzle it something might happen and they, there will be stories right mm-hmm. so some people are thinking of building a decentralized uh, autonomous organization where they will do that contribution but with two smart contracts you know smart contracts you you program that you know what's going to happen there's no room for error there's no room for mistake. Once you um, audit it, you know what's gonna, if you say, um, if A, B, C happens, do Z, once those conditions are met, it executes, it's self-executing. So they're trying to replace that now with smart contracts on the blockchain. And that's another good project. I think might see the light in this, our program we are doing, because we made the whole of fraud, the whole of, you know, some people have lost their life because uh, when they needed their money, their story is, oh, the person have run away and some people commit suicide, right? So using smart contract, okay, you know, that uh, are that self-executing and pays out who is supposed to be paid out. You know, all the rules are set out from the get-go. You don't change the rule midway. They're all set out from the get-go and you deploy it. So yes, and in our team, we have lawyers in this program and they're very much interested in smart contracts, okay? Um, Let's, let's say an artist, for example, or maybe a sculptor, or, or an artist, for example, and you have a work, right? Um, let's say make into an F- NFT, and you say, well, even though I'm trying to sell this, I want 10% royalty each time this piece gets sold. So you sell it to somebody, you get your 10%. That person resell it sometime, 10% come back to you because it's a smart contract. You can change it. It executes at the end of it, right? Once something happens, it gets executed automatically, and you get that. So yes. I mean, it's the basis of the whole blockchain, the smart contracts. And the good thing is that they can be audited. You can see flaws, although there have been some exploits that happen. But when these exploits happen, oh, you take, uh, um, you, you learn from that, right? And you make more robust smart contracts. So yes, it's the basis for making applications on the blockchain. Yeah. And in the BSV, we have the, the script. Um, um the the um we're going to do a course that have to do with scripts right uh, it's part of the last thing students in that way they talk about the smart contrast and they learn how we deploy all these things yeah thank you yes exactly that must be it the s script and i have a curiosity you built the data centers the on-premise data centers and we often hear that using blockchain especially from brian doughty you know with the um the smart ledger. He has talked about Mm. how the blockchain enables greater security than ever before. So why is that? How can it be offering this security that, that will be even better than what we've had before with data centers? Okay. Um, The main thing is based on the core principle of the blockchain which is what we call the proof of work, okay? So, um, you know, in the blockchain, data is decentralized, it's not centralized, okay? So you don't have a single computer that controls what happens. You know, there's no single source of authority on the blockchain. It's a peer-to-peer network. So when you have a data and that data has to be verified. That's what we call the proof of work. It's a complex thing. But what it simply means is that um, you have to show, okay, um, so it, it might be too technical talking about the puzzle and solving them. Let me just make it simple. So um, there's a way to show that a transaction is valid in the blockchain. That's a way to do that. And being valid can be verified. Let me give you an instance if you just what we call the encryption and hashing so if i write a letter let me say ob is a boy it's just ob is a boy few words right if i hash that word it will give me a, a key 
a unique key. Now, if I go into that OB is a boy, if I introduce a dot, the key changes. So just looking at all I need to do, once I make a hash of that, I compare with the key. If it varies, I know it has been tampered with. If it doesn't vary, it hasn't been tampered with. It's that simple. That's a method to sort out all those things. So when you have data and it's valid, every computer on the node will have a copy of that data. And because everybody have it, nobody can change it. If you change your own, the key to your data will be different from the rest of the networks. So it's easy to know that, oh, you have manipulated your data and they'll kick it out. So the data with the longest chain, the data with, let's say, if in a network of 100 people, when 51%, when 51 of the network say it is A, you go with A, all right? And it's not, it's very difficult for a few people, one person to come and overtake the network the way it is built. So two things, all right, the data uh, is, um, is encrypted, of course, but more important is decentralized. So you can't change, let me give you an insight. If you have a central server, um, let's say, I don't want to use this example, but maybe I should use it. Nigeria right now, we did our election, there's issue about the server for the election. Mm. So the INEC will say our server was attacked. You know, it was attacked numerous times. Uh, you know, what's integrity of that data, for example? We don't know. Right. Of course, there are, there are, there are um, um, of course, uh, auditing tools you can use to go in, but you can verify, okay, something was changed, but what was changed? You don't know what was changed. Mm -hmm. If it was A and you change it to B, you can only say, well, it was changed, but I don't know what it was before. It's a central server. But in a blockchain, you can do that because if you change A, every other node is saying it is B. And you that change it will not work. It's not A because the whole node in the um, in the, the whole network said it is B, right? So that makes it difficult for you to change a data on the block and makes it secure, mm -hmm. right? And you can wow. audit. You cannot erase any data. If you want to change the data, that data get kicked off from the network. It will not be part of the data on the system. So you see a data that is very accurate. It's easy for auditing. Yes, you can make a new data but it doesn't erase the old one. You can make a new data. Okay, yes, we did A, now we did B. But when we are doing audit, we can see, oh, you first did A and there's a B without erasing the data. So that's why the blockchain, you know, I've heard of companies that what they do at the end of work day, they, when they shut down their machine, before they shut down, they make a, a hash of the hard drives of their data and store the hash on the blockchain. When they come back the next morning, they make a hash again and compare what they have on the blockchain. If it has changed, you know that somebody has tampered with the data, right? But it hasn't changed. The data is, see what blockchain have lots of solution that wow. can be used. And yeah, because for the mere fact that somebody cannot just go and hijack the network and change data on it. Mm -hmm. So that's what makes it very robust, you know, and it's public. Anybody can view what is there, except for private um, blockchains, which have their own application. So yes, I mean, in that aspect, Having blockchain-based stuff gives you the confidence that this data cannot be changed, and whatever you have, it is what it is. Thank you. Wow, that's very good. I just want to add something on that, Rory, if I may. Yes, please. Okay, everything that she that he said is is amazing and significant to all the aspects of how blockchain, especially especially in the Bitcoin SV technology right mm -hmm. and also um one of the key things also is avoiding for the system to have double spending so whatever comes in first everyone will upon the, uh, will validate that that is the true transaction that happened so the next um transaction and uh, note if 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 you happen to do a double spending or mm -hmm. or or like split millisecond the first one who comes in is the true one transaction. So um, with that, with that, it secured the network, right? So they it avoid double spending. So um, like what like what Kalisas have said, if more than fifty percent of the network said that it is the true transaction, then it is the true transaction. So um, it is it is secured in that sense. Um, not not all blockchain can can do such. Yes. And mm -hmm. also, also one of the factors that um, 
like uh, I happen to uh, understand as well from the conversation I had with Xiaowei Liu, only Bitcoin SV has the capacity to actually use multiple zero knowledge proof in one system. Most of the blockchains economically can just use one zero knowledge proof. And so it's a mind blowing, right? Mm -hmm. So we have different kinds of zero knowledge proof. Um, so um, so Bitcoin SV can use multiple, two or more in one system. So that's make it more secure. That's Thank how you. scalable and Bitcoin SV May I ask, what is a zero knowledge proof used for? It is used to actually um, hide the, like, um, it, is, it is used to actually have the have the items inside be confidential right so confidentiality oh. means means a lot All right so so it's like the sealed stamp on the envelope yeah something like you know, you know that it happened you know that it happened but you do not know entirely the details of the the person who transacted and that makes it secure because this the system can validate that the payment has been made but your data, like the numbers of your card, everything, your yeah. names and stuff like that are, well, um, are confidential in that sense. So right. the entire system can know, oh, it happens. I pay you. And if you tell me, no, you didn't pay yet. No, the system, everyone knows that I pay you already. Right. Something like that. But I no see. one can hack the information. So what happened in the space is like, um, for example, we pay online. And then, you know, we input all the data, like our name, CVV, the car details, right? And it goes to a central database. And then that's the honeypot of all the hackers. And they can actually get it. And some people can sell it in the dark web. So there's where, where the hacking happiness. But if you use your knowledge proof, you can say that, okay, the payment has been made. But even though... The, the transaction or the information was there, you can never see exactly what it is or whoever owns it because they cannot see the details. It's all it's all cryptographic in that sense. If that is correct, Mr. Callistos. Yeah, so, so uh, she explained it um, very, very well already because the whole point is, it, it calls down to computer also, the whole point is, you look i've talked about the hash you look at the keys so if abc has happened therefore in the script you put all your all the things the terms that goes into it you know the terms of the contract going to the script at the end of the day there's a hash of it so what you're looking at the hash all right so if you want to verify something you don't need to go through the whole details of what happened in the chain to know you could look at the first few blocks all right and if they all match up so okay yeah if they be Let's say you go six blocks. I say if this is correct, then everything is correct. You don't have to go start, you know, unraveling everything, because the 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 the, 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 the mathematics that gave up to that encryption um, um, hashing already has taken care of all those things. So you're just looking at the, the hashes, and that's what we call the Merkle tree. It's a it's a it's a, a a very nice data structure for storing data where when you're traversing it. Okay, in the Merkle trees like. You know, um, I think it's other. It's not linear, but it's like the binary tree. For example, using the binary tree, where you have each for each step you go, you create it, you divide it into half, into half. So you know, when you do that, it's very very fast. You know, using the Merkle tree to um, store, you know, as a data structure for that. Yeah, but the important thing is all those hashing keys. That's what you compare. But once they change, you know, oh, it has changed, and then you can discard it. So you can verify. It, putting it simple, um, if I bring a puzzle, let's say um, the map of Africa, for example, oh, is common. I if I bring the map of Africa and let's say you, you make a puzzle out of it and scatter everything, right? I can, okay, put it back. It will take you time to put it back. You know, effort might take you hours or even days to put it back. But the moment you finish putting it by anybody, oh yeah, that's the map of Africa, okay? And this is Nigeria and the heart of it. So let's say you bring out all these countries, you know, you make them into or, 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 or this origami or stuff, right? Mm -hmm. 
and then you say hey put back the puzzle together it will take you time to do that but the moment you finish it if you remove nigeria from here for example put it in south africa i would look at it and say ah this is not correct but mm -hmm. if everything sits proper you know it is correct so build the proof of work she talked about you know building that initially yeah it takes and it takes time now that's um that's where you spend the energy and everything for but once you get the solution verifying the solution is very easy so that's it you just verify okay that's it everything in there is um, is accurate everything there is valid maintain that they are all valid so you go with it yeah thank you thank you yes and what you have both touched on is the constant theme of both transparency and privacy so that is a part of the impact of blockchain of bitcoin blockchain is that it does enable that full transparency with privacy so it's really a wonderful uh, opportunity for the world i'm very excited it now is. speaking of the world please Callistus, tell us about your home nigeria what can we learn <laughs> Uh, and also, I understand you're in Enugu State, so I have that map as well. And yes, what are some interesting things about your hometown, please? Okay, uh, my hometown, actually, yeah, Enugu State is a city where I, I stayed there for a while, right? My hometown is Anambra State, actually, and down to my village. So the common thing about my home is it's a village. It's a very nice place. You know, you have the trees. Um, very serene environment, right? And um, it's, it don't have much hustle and bustle, right? So Ooh. we go to the cities where we do all the marketing, all the work and driving and the fumes and everything, right? But in my village, yeah, I mean, it's quite a very nice place. We are very warm people, very, very warm, you know, acceptable, uh, receptive to strangers, right? And um, our food is unique. Let me say something about Nigeria. Nigeria yes. is multi-ethnic, multi-ethnic. So if I describe my place, it won't give you the whole idea. Mm. I've had the opportunity of staying where we call it in the northern Nigeria, for example, in Plateau State Joss, in Abuja, right? And in the course of this program, I've interacted with students from Kano State, from Zamfara State. They are different. So the culture varies. It's not the same. As you go from one region to the other region, you see some variation, right? both in religion, in ethnicity, in food, and even in language. So it's multi-ethnic. And that's why, and also the, the environment too. Let me give you an instance. If you go to Joss in Plateau State, you have something like winter. It, it's not winter exactly, but the environment is different from every other state. So if you're coming from, let's say you've lived in, the, in Europe all your life, if you go to Joss, the weather will be like you can fit in very well. In fact, in Joss, we have, the last time I went there, I bought um, raspberries. I went to the, a farm and I can pluck raspberries. Very fresh and so sweet. Sweeter than what I have eaten when I was in the UK. I'm, I'm, I'm serious, wow. right? Yes. Yes, I went to the farm because I was looking at and big farms like this and you can actually pluck those things and eat them fresh like that. Meanwhile, in my place, Anambra State, we don't have that because of the environment, the weather there doesn't support the growth of those things. So Nigeria is multi-ethnic, uh, multicultural, and that's why it as is anybody can stay here. You know, there must be one area, one part that suits your lifestyle, right? You can mm -hmm. be in Lagos, there's technology going on there, all the high tech thing happens in Lagos. You'd be in Abuja, oh, it's very serene, big houses, big roads, well planned, you know, everything is so so organized in Abuja, you know, the, the roads, the, the buildings, you know, you, you look like you're in New York. No, no, New York is too busy for Abuja. Abuja is a very quiet and peaceful place to stay, right? And same thing with other cities. So Nigeria is some place that you come, no matter your, um, you know, what, whatever is your outlook, okay, you must see a city where you fit in very well and do business. And thanks to decentralization, thanks to blockchain, we are hoping to get solution that bridge everything. You can be anywhere, you know, and do your stuff seamlessly and transparently in a way that is secured, right? Mm. So yes, I, yes. Roy, I hope, I hope someday you visit Nigeria, right? Because Thank let me you. tell you what, 
Um, the first company, com the first computer company, I co-founded it with an American. It's called Caltech Integrated Services. Um, Leonard Ronyo, he's an American. He's been in Nigeria working in an oil company. So um, we, we co-founded Caltech Computers, uh, Caltech Integrated Services, okay? And he lived in Nigeria all his life before he went back to the US, right? So it's, it's a very nice place, really. <laughs> yes, that's exciting. And I love the concept of having many different environments in one place. It reminds me of New Zealand. I've heard the same thing about New Zealand where you can have the mountains and then the beach all in one country. <laughs> You know, it's a variety. So, how exciting. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah, again, what are some... this all my country. Yes, tell us, <laughs> when please. To... How is the <laughs> when it comes to diversity, like Philippines is, is an island, right? Not an island. It's a group of islands. So, we have 7,106 islands, depending if it's low tide or high tide. So just recently, uh, in 2022, they claim that we have 7,646 islands. So imagine the diversity of highlands, mountains, and then beaches, and then flats. So we we all have um, all the all the the kinds of of land forms and water forms in one country. And uh, when when I went to Africa back in November. I was like, I, I feel like home. I feel like home because I see trees, I see birds, I see the climate. It's it's warm. It's it's not too cold. It's not too hot. So I I feel like home. But the but the difference is that when I visit Uganda, people and big birds in the city coexist. Like you can walk on the street with the big birds walking as well beside you i never experienced that in the philippines if we see her big birds in the city it will be in the kitchen with some beers <laughs> right so <laughs> it's, it's those party it is, yeah so i don't see the same thing in in the philippines so but we also have wild forest here in the philippines like it's still very healthy in the Philippines. So when I was in Africa, yes, I feel lo like home. So I want us all to go with Nigeria and feel that different types of weather in the same country because here we don't have very, very cold area. Like we only have here like Baguio City or Tagaytay, the coldest parts of the Philippines and also some parts in the Mindanao, but not we don't have here winter. We only have two seasons here, rainy season and summer. So that's that's where the Philippines play. Wow. Yes, and welcome also to Marietta, Georgia, uh, my hometown. <laughs> I grew up here and we have the Chattahoochee River. The Chattahoochee River is a, a word that means painted stone. So there's many colors on the river. And we do have big birds, but they're typically in the water. And walking down the street, I see birds every day, flocks of birds, but they vary according to the seasons and their travels. So lately I've seen a lot of robins, and then we always have a lot of the uh, mockingbirds in my neighborhood. <laughs> and they're quite funny because they fly right close to you and look at you. <laughs> So they, yes, they what, mimic sounds, right? They mimic sounds. They do. The mockingbirds yes. mimic sounds. Oh my god. They do. Yes, yeah. they do. So they're very I funny. Do we have a, some too. turtle doves, doves as well, and bluebirds. The cardinals have been arriving. I call them Cardi B. Uh, yes, but what are what are the birds like where you live, Calistus? Um, yeah. Um, Mainly we have white birds, you know, um, um, growing up, I know you wake up in the morning, what greets you are the birds singing. You have the, the one doing coo, 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 you know, you have the, uh, the sparrows, they're all shipping. So yes, we have lots of them. Um, in fact, as a kid in the village then, uh, 
sometimes how you know it's noon there are some birds that you know that cry during about that time you know oh it's noon already once you hear the, oh it's noon right <laughs> so yeah i mean nigeria yeah. here we are so in tune to nature yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is just you know coming off yeah we are so in tune in, in tune with nature i'm uh i didn't study birds you know so i don't know way much about them like um you know their character and what they do right but yes i can't tell you that we it, you know you you, you wake up uh, birds are even at night you know you could hear you could hear birds cry so yes we have all varieties of them here um for but um for the exotic one like say ostrich and also fly that you see them made in the zoos okay right I, I was in just recently um during the course of this need that pro this um, scholarship program so i visited the zoo there yeah so yeah you go there you see like the ostrich they are not common birds yeah right yeah but other than that um we have so many species of them so i didn't study birds so i don't know the names and their botanical <laughs> whatever it is yeah but I promise you there are lots of them. And and they vary. What you see in the southern part of Nigeria, you go to this the northern part, you see a different species of bird. Of course, that Charles Darwin made us understand that you find animals that, that were able to adapt to a particular habitat. So because of the diversity of Nigeria in every in weather and climate, you have diverse wildlife in Nigeria also. Yes. That's lovely. And with the great diversity in Nigeria, is there anything that unifies you that you feel is Nigerian? Uh, okay, uh, first it's our language. Um, for obvious reason, because we are multi-ethnic uh, uh, groups, so they adopted the English as the official language, right? But when you go to the regions, like if you go to the south, Southeast, for example, predominantly you see Igbo language there. If you go to the southwest, you see Yoruba. If you go to the north, you see the Alsa language. And there are so many other mini, mini groups. Like in, in River State, you have the Ikwere, you have the Calabari. So there are lots of them, but so language do. And we can't remove religion also, you know, because Nigeria, you have that high religion. We have two major ones. You have the Christian and you have the Muslims, right? And some states, like in the southwest, you have a mix of Christians and Muslims in the southwest, okay? But in the southeast, you have predominantly Christians. If you go to the north, it's predominantly um, um, a Muslim. But the good thing is, they all cohabit and they're mm -hmm. in harmony. Okay, let me give you an instance. Um, in in a primary school in Jos, for example, um, there's this school, Ansarudin Primary School. It's a Muslim school, but during um, uh, morning, you know, assembly when they are when they come to the assembly in the morning to you know do the assembly and go to their classes. What happens is the Muslims will say their prayers first. When they are done, the Christians will say their own prayer. So they, you see how, so even though you are not Christian, you are not a Muslim and you're a Christian, you know how the Muslims pray. You know every yeah. day, you know everything they say. And even though you're a Muslim, you're not a Christian, you know everything. You can sing our father from beginning to end because we all cohabit, wow. right? So if I, if you if you see the map of the coat of arm of Nigeria, the map of Nigeria, we talk about unity, unity in diversity, right? Mm -hmm. So that's it. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah. I love that. Unity and diversity. Thank you. That's right. Well, I am grateful to you, Calistas and Krez, uh, for our time together. This has been wonderful. And I hope that we can do this regularly. <laughs> we should get together. So thank you for telling us about all of your amazing projects and powerful work that you're doing to empower the people uh, in Nigeria, the students and the builders, to build solutions that impact the people in wonderful ways. And also thank you for being with us today. So. Is there anything that I left out or that you think you'd like to share with the audience? No, I think you've been very great. I think you touched on a lot of things. Um, only that I think Chris and I will have to catch up because uh, we have other things we, we, we discussed the last time we want to get to see more, more interaction with our students. So it's something I work out with Chris after this. 
And maybe next time we come here, you get to know more. <laughs> Thank you. Lovely. Yes, Thank you. yes. Love to love to um, expose to the world how brilliant the students in Nigeria. Right. Yes. Uh, on my end, I just want to invite everyone to keep um, you know, subscribe to this channel because Rory is one of the advocate, VSV advocate, who is, you know, who is one of the few people <laughs> one of one of the heroes of vsv who um promote vsv projects so if you have projects uh like uh vsv projects or if you are a bitcoin sv enthusiast please connect with rory she's a she's very approachable and very nice person in and out of the camera so please reach out to her and also please follow our socials like um our um, bitcoinsv.com or socials on Twitter, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook. So Bitcoin Association, Bitcoin SV Academy on LinkedIn, BSV Academy, um, Bitcoin SV. Maybe Rory can share that on the description. And also need the project Dominium, right? And us, Callistus and Crisenda. Yes. That's all. They will stay in the loop. Thank you so much, Rory, for having us. Oh, it's my pleasure, my joy. And I will include links to all of your groups in the description box below. So those who are watching, welcome to subscribe and join the conversation. Leave your comments below. What are the birds like where you live? We'd love to hear. And also, if you're curious to learn more about Bitcoin blockchain, then follow Krez and Callistus on LinkedIn and we'll look forward to being together in the moment again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And bye-bye. Thank you so much. See you in the next one. Thank you, Rory. Bye.